Hello and welcome everyone to Metro's second virtual foundational fathers gathering. My name is Scott Dixon. I'll be the moderator for today's event. Before we kick things off, I've got a few things to cover. If you guys can all open up the chat, we're going to use the chat for today's session as well as Q&A. But for now, go ahead and open up your chat. It should be in the toolbar in your Zoom controls or if you're on your phone, you'll have to tap the dots and the more go to chat. You'll notice the selector for panelists or all attendees and panelists select the, the second and then go ahead and type in the chat real quick just what your Thanksgiving plans are for next week. I'll give everybody a minute here to respond. So in the chat, type what your Thanksgiving plans are for next week. Family gathering, football, staying home, watching Metro football, got family in town. Sounds like a lot of family and football, which is good stuff. In the same toolbar, you'll see the Q&A feature. We'll use this to answer questions or to, to, for you guys to ask questions uh, for Coach Raider to answer those. That pretty much covers my portion. So I'm gonna turn it over to Scott Williams for him to pray and kick things off. All right, thanks Scott. And good morning, Metro family and, and friends. Uh, glad to have those participating today and, and those who will participate after the fact um, via uh, our recording. So. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer, and then uh, I'm going to introduce Coach Raider, and we'll get going, let him get started. So, God, we love you, and we thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord. Thank you that uh, you provide this technology that we have to be able to uh, get together virtually, um, despite everything that is going on. We uh, thank you for the Metro community and the blessings that it provides, that it uh is committed to these types of opportunities, Lord, to bring individuals like Coach Raider uh, together with a group of us, Lord, so that uh, we can draw nearer to you. I thank you for Coach Raider and, and all that he has done. He's uh, been an incredible pillar of the Tulsa community and continues uh, to have a significant impact on so many different things, Lord. I just pray that you uh, bless him today, uh, give him the words of wisdom that you would have him share with us today and uh, let us all walk away uh, better people as a result. Lord, thank you so much uh, again for the most important thing, which is your son, Jesus Christ, that you sent to die on the cross for our sins, Lord, and provide our way for uh, salvation. So thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, so um, it really is a true privilege and, and honor to introduce uh, our guest speaker today. Um, I've had the incredible privilege of uh, getting to know uh, Coach Dave Rader, and, and I know that although he's not no longer in the football coaching profession, that uh, he still is in the coaching profession as he um, makes a significant impact on so many lives through the different ways that he serves uh, in the community and in the state. Um, I've known Coach Rader. We've had the opportunity to serve together as deacons at our church. I also had the privilege of participating in a uh, small uh, men's Bible study leadership group with him for a year and uh, he's just blessed me in so many ways, uh, not just in the words that he shared, but just in the example um, that he has, uh, has set. Um, he's been a pillar, as I mentioned, of the Tulsa community. He's a graduate of Tulsa's Will Rogers High School, and then went on to uh, the University of Tulsa, where he was a, a two-year starter at quarterback and uh, graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, he was drafted by the NFL San Diego Chargers and finished his professional career with the uh, New York Giants before retiring from professional football. Um, his college coaching career spans 22 years and four decades. 
including 12 years as the head football coach at the University of Tulsa, where he was awarded the NCAA District Coach of the Year honor in 1991 after leading the Golden Hurricanes to a 10 and two record, a victory in the Freedom Bowl, and a final national ranking of 22nd in the country. Other coaching stops included the University of Alabama, Mississippi State University, and the University of Mississippi. He is currently a member of the Will Rogers High School, Tulsa Public Schools, University of Tulsa, and the Independence Bowl Halls of Fame. And in 2008, he was awarded the Merv Johnson Integrity and Coaching Award by the National Football Foundation and College Hall of Fame. He was first elected to the Oklahoma State Senate in November 2016 and was recently reelected in November 2020. He currently serves on the following committees. He's the chair of the Senate Republican Caucus, the vice chair of the Appropriations Committee. He's also a member of the Finance Committee, the Public Safety Committee, and the Energy Committee. I'm not sure what anybody else is doing in the Senate because it sounds like Coach Raider's on all the different committees right now serving, which doesn't shock me. Um, he currently serves on several boards throughout our community and is a deacon at First Baptist Church of Tulsa. He's self-employed and primarily works in the industry, I'm sorry, excuse me, works in the energy industry, primarily in the midstream sex, uh, sector. He and his wife, Janet, have been married for 42 years and they have three children and eight wonderful, beautiful grandchildren. And Coach Rader is also a published author. Uh, you can find his book, which was published in 2011, entitled The Missing Playbook Page, Fundamentals Behind the Physical, Mental, and emotional elements of commitment. Coach Rader, thank you so much for joining us today. It really is a privilege to have you speak to us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you. And uh, when you get done, we'll do a uh, short Q&A. So thanks okay. coach, it's yours. Wow, thank you, Scott. And, um, appreciate that. This is indeed an honor to uh, be with the group. And good morning to everybody. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. Uh, Scott, I had to chuckle there a little bit. Uh, appreciate you saying that I retired my um, NFL career. It was more or less, they told me I wasn't as good as I thought I was and needed to go home. So, uh, in fact, this part of the story, we won't go into it too much today about what I've learned from being fired. And that happens when you get into coaching and other, other things. And, Probably some people out there uh, have been through it as well. Um, and you say, it, you know, I'm really coaching well last night, um, these days, because last night I was on, in my chair um, coaching TU back to a victory. What a finish that was. And I'm sure many of you all were watching it as well. And it just makes you love college football when things like that happen, especially when they happen for your team, instead of against your team. Um, some of some of my story was told there, um, and right now we're, we're serving as a state senator. But I'm, I'm going to talk this morning about uh, some things uh, that I've learned from coaching, and uh, I entitled it "Of All I Learned in Coaching, This Is Number One." And we've learned so many things through our life and, and the in, the uh, professions that we're involved in. And coaching was a great profession for me, and, and taught me many many things. I entered coaching uh, in um, 1983. Um, the coach that fired me from the New York Giants hired me at, at the University of Alabama, Ray Perkins, and we started uh, coaching there. It, it was incredible um, uh, high odds against uh, uh, coaching at Alabama, and then to start there was even higher odds, and it was a great place to learn. I learned so much football from Coach Perkins, and we started there, and, of course, uh, Coach um, – Coming in after Coach Bryant, that was a very, very tough it, uh, way to start. And Coach Bryant passed away about three weeks after we were hired. And, and Coach Perkins uh, took the, the program from then on. And so I started a season of coaching. When we coached for 22 seasons. And enjoyed um, so much about coaching. And so to you, um, Foundation Dads, uh, to um, I'd just like to tell you some things that I learned and then end up with the number one thing that I learned through that. And maybe um, somebody can take something home from this. Um, one of the things that happened um, 
was meeting uh, famous people um, while, while I was a head coach. And uh, sometimes they're famous within the community and sometimes they're famous within a state and sometimes they're famous within a country. And of course, if, if you have any athletic event whatsoever, one of the highlights for me was meeting uh, uh, Coach Iba, Mr. Iba. He was uh, watching our uh, basketball team practice and I was told that Mr. Iba was on campus and in the building and I was not going to turn down that opportunity and I walked over to meet him as he was watching our basketball team uh, practice and he was so gracious to me I mean he had no reason to greet me and, and he actually knew some things about me and made sure that he brought those points out and, uh, you know this is a guy that is quoted in one of his best quotes it says there are two people you can not lie to yourself and God and you know, you talk to anybody ever played for Mr. Ivor, there was um, his genuineness and his integrity, and, and you know, you learn life lessons like that. That there are two people you cannot lie to yourself and God, and you take that and, and you carry that with you a long time. Um, then there was another time I was going out to practice, and um, a gentleman met me on, on the field. I'd never seen him before. And he said he was there because somebody from the vice president's office was going to come to practice. And I thought that was great. I'd been at the university for four or five seasons. And, and uh, I thought I knew everybody on campus. But if one of the vice presidents wanted to come to practice, that'd be great. And then it uh, dawned on me uh, as he continued to talk that it was going to be the vice president of the United States who was going to come by practice. So. Um, the next day, I was able to meet Vice President Quayle. And that was, you know, one of those highlights to, to meet a Vice President of the United States. But, you know, meeting famous people and learning from them, that is still not number one of the things that I learn in coaching. Um, if you're around me very much, you know that I, I love baseball. Uh, but I still believe that football is the greatest game ever invented uh, because it teaches one thing the best, and that is, if you're knocked down, you get back up. And when you get knocked down, you get back up. And man, can you take that lesson and, and teach it to young men over and over again? And the, the game teaches you that. Um, it's like uh, last night you saw a team come back from that. Um, you know, they were knocked down, they can't, they can't you get back up. And you hope that the Tulane team, you know, when they're knocked down at the end, that they'll be able to get back up. Um, but I'm talking this morning about what I learned from coaching, but not from the game, but I think it's worthy to, to bring that up. But that's not number one. Um, uh, pastor at our church loves to quote uh, Winston Churchill. Um, and it kind of goes into what I was just talking about. And he, one of uh, his most famous speeches, uh, Winston Churchill said this, and I'm going to quote him here. But for everyone, surely, what we've gone through this period, now this is October 1941, what we've gone through this period, I'm addressing myself to the school. And he's <clears throat> speaking to Harrow School uh, in England. I believe that's where he attended school. He's back to talk at his alma mater. Surely for this period of 10 months, this is the lesson. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. Never in nothing, great or small, large or petty. Never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. I mean, how good a counsel is that? That is great counsel. I had to think back as I was coaching. You learn so much from the young man and, and you try to teach him that when you get knocked down, you get back up and you try to teach him to never give in. You, at the same time, you... You never give in except for convictions of honor and good sense. And you're trying to teach integrity to young men and do this. And sometimes they teach it back to you. Uh, in 1995, I know that's a long time ago for many of you that are watching. We were playing Oklahoma State here in Tulsa. And uh, I looked up at the clock. It was about eight minutes to go in the game. And people were starting to leave uh, the stadium. And we were behind 20 points. And uh, we scored. Uh, and then we did an onside kick and um, recovered the onside kick. And then we scored, and now we're down by six. And we decided to kick off and see if our defense could hold and our defense held. 
and then we scored at the end of the game and we came back and scored 21 points in those last eight minutes uh, for one of the greatest comebacks that I've ever been around. And I learned from those youngsters that if you put that to the test, sometimes it comes back for you. And they taught me that never give up, never give in, uh, just keep fighting. And it worked out to our favor that night and, and we won the game. But even as big as that game was, and anytime the University of Tulsa could beat Oklahoma State University, of course, it's a big win. And uh, but that's still not number one of uh, what we lost, what we, uh, what I've learned. Uh, if you talk to my wife, <clears throat> she has a, a saying about coaching and I'll, I'll uh, mention her, you her quote here in a little bit, but it, in uh, 2006, I was at the University of Alabama. And we were playing at Arkansas and we lost it in overtime uh, because we had missed um, an extra point and two field goals. And, you know, as a coach, you try to have everything exactly right and put into place and then you follow the game plan and of course it's supposed to all go your way. And so you learn a great deal about planning, about uh, implementing a plan, about having people buy into a plan. And these are great lessons to be learned. And then sometimes um, it doesn't work out your way. And so if you'd ask my wife, she'll say, she'll say, what do you think about coaching? She'll tell you right now. I said, well, coach, uh, kickers will get you fired. So we, we were actually lost our job at the end of that year. And you go back and say, well, if we just made a field goal, uh, we would have continued winning there. But not to put the blame on, on one person, it's just kind of what I'm trying to say. The concept is as much as you plan, sometimes it goes your way, sometimes it doesn't go your way. But you have to make the plan. You have to learn how to do that, to implement the plan. You have to learn the plan and then stick with the plan. And then sometimes it still doesn't turn out your way. You have to learn to come back. It's still not the number one thing I learned from coaching, even though it's a very, very, very important, important lesson to learn. I was thinking about our 1991 team, which ended up um, being number 22 in the country and probably should have been higher, except that when we won our bowl game, we were on the West Coast. And then at that time, of course, um, there wasn't as much uh, social media and, and or media period going on. So we kind of were lost in the bowl season because we played a night game on the West Coast, but we still ended up 22 in the country. And one thing that happened that year is that Texas A&M came to Tulsa. And we were playing Texas A&M. They were ranked in the top 15 and top 10, somewhere in there. And we won that game. Uh, and then the next week, University of Miami came, came in. And I think they were ranked number one or number two. And I learned that in that week, I was reminded, I guess I should say, that, you know, that teams, every time they go in, into the locker room and before they come out of the locker room, every, every team's going to pray. And I'm sure there's some of us in the locker room where we're praying for to win, not just to stay healthy, but to win. Let's just be very, very frank about that. But I learned this. Most of the time, most of the time, God favors the team with more talent. Make sense? That's who he usually favors. So we pray, we trust God, and still sometimes it still doesn't go your way. Because you learn in life, there's always somebody bigger, faster, and stronger. There's always somebody bigger, faster, and stronger. And you have to learn to deal with that. Doesn't mean that God is not good, that God doesn't love you. These are the things that we learn. And you have to learn to deal with that. And you have to learn to do the very best that you can. So these are the things that you try to pass on a young men, but still that's not the number one thing that I learned from coaching. Sometimes you have to learn to deal with negative aspects on it. Um, in coaching, I've been fired three times. Okay. Again, from my pastor, I learned that as soon as I became a follower of Christ, I gave up the right to be offended. Now think about that. As soon as I became a follower of Christ, I gave up the right to be offended because my identity is in Christ, 
my identity is not supposed to be in my team. My identity is not supposed to be in my profession. My identity is not even not supposed to be in my family. So when things get bad and social media and the internet did grow from the last time I talked to you about it there in the, my last example, and um, realize that people put in websites that say firedavebrader.com and there's a chat board on there and people are saying all sorts of things about you, you still have to learn not to be offended and still believe in what you're doing and doing it the right way. And I learned at that point, you know, you could be exactly in God's will, doing exactly what you know you're supposed to be doing. And sometimes it turns south. It's a hard lesson to learn. So within this example, I've learned you can't be offended because it's not about you. And I've learned you can be doing exactly what you've been called to do. And sometimes it ends the way that you're not planning for it to end. Even at that, that wasn't the number one thing that I learned as important as that that is and was most important thing that I learned came in that period where I talked to you about when I started at the University of Alabama as a young man 25 years old on the staff of Ray Perkins at the University of Alabama we we're going to follow coach Bryant now think about that we're going to follow coach Bryant huge task and coach Bryant passes away well, during that period of grief and mourning, so many of his players came back to the offices. They wanted to see Mrs. Bryant. They wanted to see each other. They wanted to pay their respects to Coach Bryant. And these, all these names were back on campus and right there in the football building. You know, Joe Namath was there, and Kenny Staver was there, and Leroy Jordan was there. I mean, these, these are great names out of Alabama football. And one of his former players, who, and reportedly one of, his, one of his favorite players, was a guy by the name of Steve Sloan. And Steve Sloan was coaching at Duke at that time, and, and he was known for his innovation and in offense. I was at Alabama coaching quarterbacks being a part of the offense and I really wanted to talk to Steve Sloan. I really wanted to uh, learn from him what all he was doing at Duke and, you know, the players are going back and forth and, and all at once he was coming down the hallway and I was in my office and I asked him if he had a couple of minutes. He said, sure. He was very gracious. I said, you know, here I am. I'm very young, learning this game, want to do it the right way. What can you tell me? What can you give me that I I should know it would help me to be a better coach. And I was truly expecting him to go to the chalkboard and to go, again, this is the days of chalkboard. We actually had chalk on the grease board. And I was waiting for him to go to that board and start showing me some of the plays they're running and the concepts and what they're trying to do. And I just saw him stand there at the door and he just looked for a little while and he's kind of, you could tell he was thinking He said, I'll tell you what to really help you. He says, make sure you tell the truth. Make sure you always tell the truth. You have to realize it's better for your players to be mad at you for 24 hours and to doubt your integrity and not respect you for the rest of your life. Always tell the truth. Well, it wasn't what I was expecting. But that's the number one thing I learned from coaching. Tell the truth. Always tell the truth. It's better for your players to be mad at you for 24 hours rather than to doubt your integrity the rest of your life. And in attempting to abide in Jesus as a believer, we find some of the characteristic traits of God and reach such as being omnipresent, omnipotent, 
and omniscient. We just can't reach that. But there is a characteristic trait of God that we can very much model, and that's his veracity. Such an honor to be able to represent him with our veracity. We learn from Matthew 5, 37, in the words of Jesus says, I'll let your yes be yes and your no be no. It's that simple. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. Thus saith the Lord. And for all the dads and the grandfathers out there, we look back at Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, where we're reminded again, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Gentlemen, we can't teach these things if we lack integrity. And we know that our children can see through us so easily. Tell the truth. Always tell the truth. It's better that they be mad at you for 24 hours than doubt your integrity the rest of your life. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. That is the most important thing I've learned from coaching. We'll open it up for questions now and or dialogue. Scott, it's you. All right, coach, thank you so much. What a uh, what an incredibly powerful message and reminder um, to all of us. And, and as you said there at the end, um, as, as dads, as granddads that may be joining us, again, so important that the behavior that we want to see out of our children is the behavior that we model. And we have to have the integrity to be able to do that because you're right. Our kids, they do see what we do and they hear what we say. And if those things don't match up, it, uh, it's hard to plant the proper seeds. So we'll open it up for questions again. I think uh, Scott, we're using the Q and A feature. Uh, yes. If you guys have a question for coach, that's the box down at the bottom with the uh, Q&A on it and the little uh, word bubbles. So if you guys have a question, uh, type it in there and then I'll ask it to, uh, I'll ask it to Coach Rader. Coach, I will, I'll, I'll ask one question. I don't have anything in here yet. Gets uh, our participants some time to type in there, but um, in your career, I, you know, the numbers are probably enormous for the number of players that, uh, that you, you coached. Um, who, would, who would you say is the one player that achieved at the highest level, not necessarily based on the talent that they were given, but based off of the work and the time that they, that they put in um, to be successful? Great question. For many around the Tulsa area, I'll give you a name. and it, He is Jerry Ostrowski. Jerry came to us from Philadelphia. Um, Mark Thomas recruited him here and is a talented individual. But after he, and, and he was an All-American for us, I think the last All-American at the University of Tulsa, uh, although I'm sure Zayvon Collins will, will be that this year. But Jerry was cut a couple of times in the NFL. And he, he was, even though he's talented, they thought there's more other people talented. Uh, and Jerry just kept going back to training camp, kept going back to training camp, and then he ended up playing 10 years in the NFL. Um, I just have to respect him for doing that because what he did was, um, to me, exemplary. I've never given in, never given up. And, and he took the talent that he had and he ended up playing 10 years. Cool. I, 
we had a question related back to your number one thing you uh, learned in coaching. Um, can you give us a specific example or the toughest situation and when you had yeah. to had to be honest with somebody and, and live live out the truth and, and how did it end up? I have a couple of stories. I, I'll tell you one that ended up positively, okay? Because that's, we like those positive stories, right? We were getting ready to go to that, the bowl game in 91. And I know, excuse me, preceding the bowl team that we had, we had a young man on our team that was extremely talented, could run, was strong, um, could tackle extremely well, was just uh, a really talented player, but he, he could not follow the do right rule. He just could not do right. And so uh, I brought him in the office and uh, I told him he can't uh, be on our team anymore. <clears throat> you know, we've tried, we've, we've worked with you and you just, you, know, you continue to embarrass us in the, uh, in the public sector. You continually not want to go to class. You, you know, you're, you're just not doing anything we're asking. We're at the kick, you, you know, I just, you can't have, can't be on our team. Well, shortly thereafter, three of his teammates came in and said, coach, um, we'll take him. Um, we'll take him and we'll, we'll make sure that he does right. I said, are you sure you want to do that? Because I mean, you, we listed all the things he's got there. So coach, we'll take him. I said, okay, he's yours. You take him. And lo and behold, that next August, when I'm counting the votes for team captains, who's one of the highest vote getters? <laughs> this young man. I have to make him a captain, even though the team knew that I'd kicked him off. They know that they voted for him, so I'm gonna have to make him a captain. He becomes a captain. He plays the whole year. We go to the bowl team, bowl game. He talks to the team before the the night before and gets them all fired up. We win the game. The next time, one of the next times that I, I we're keeping up with him, he is the driver of the United States bobsled team that wins a silver medal in Salt Lake City. That's a good story right there, gentlemen. That's a good story. Yeah, that really is. And 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 think about the fact that you being truthful and then ultimately his teammates being truthful with him probably changed the direction of his, of his life. Uh, exactly. that's, that's awesome. So another question we got was, um, you know, you shared and talked about your situation and, and having gone through disappointments and loss of jobs. W what would you say is the greatest lesson you learned in dealing with that difficulty or that disappointment? God does not, God does not love me based on my position. His, his blessings are new every morning. I'm not just saying this as a believer. I'm going to tell you when it comes down to that and you you think your identity is in, in your job and you're very well known and there's people out there that know you. And then all at once, the people that, have your paycheck tell you you can't come back into this office any longer and they put it on in the paper and it goes all around and you and you know that for that for that 24 hour news cycle everybody in your community knows that you lost your job god's still very real and i know there's i'm talking to guys out there you you know we've lost family members, you, you've lost family members and, and all these disappointments. And again, to me, that's one of the great things that we learned from, from, from our, our jobs, especially I learned there, God is still good. God still loves you. And my identity is in him and not in my job. So you okay. can tell them in politics now, Scott, because I just keep talking. <laughs> well, I, here's a here's a here's a great question too. You know, with for a, I, and I can see this with a lot of our dads. Obviously, you've held some high leadership positions. Um, what have you seen as being the most effective methods to get buy-in from the people that you have responsibility of overseeing, whether it be your staff 
or the student athletes in your program? You know, what, what are some of the tips or, or ideas that you would give that were most successful for you in, in developing that buy-in as the leader? Well, you, you, have to, <clears throat> you have to let everybody talk. You have to have all ideas on the table and you have to dissect them and you have to go through them and the pluses and the minuses. And, and then you have to make a decision and then you have to have the buy-in on that decision that once you walk out of the door, everybody is, is in agreement. Even though I rejected your idea and went with somebody else's idea, we all had the agreement before we ever went in there, we're going to hammer this thing out. But they know they've had their chance to present their ideas. They know they've had their chance for everybody else to listen to them, okay? It just wasn't this time that we're gonna buy into your idea. We're gonna go with somebody else's idea or go with my idea. So listening, making sure everybody has a chance to, to give their point of view, make sure you're listening, you know, not looking at your phone or anything like that, but you're engaged in their ideas and you're really working through that. And, and, and to me, you, you have to be able to do that. And that's the only way you can get buy-in from everybody. So when things are going bad on your team and some of the players come in and say, hey, here's some things that we need to do better, you know, you have to listen. And you, and you have to, even through, um, what might be considered your subordinates, you have to listen because so many, many times they have some great ideas that come to them and you have to be genuine with them. That's great. Um, another question uh, that popped up from one of the dads is, is in your current profession um, in the political field, obviously um, this is a very divisive time how do you stay positive when dealing with others who may have different opinions um, as uh, far as uh, that is concerned, as far as you kind of balancing living out your, living out your faith while serving in a, in a highly charged area? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I would love to give you a Sunday morning answer here and say, I just stay, you know, abiding in Jesus. But I want to be real with you here. I did not handle this last election period very well. I was complaining to my wife all the time. People were, were edgy. People were uh, much more uh, angry than they were in 2016. And some of that, you know, when you knock on a person's door and they just yell at you, and you say, I'm just trying to represent you. You know, you, you can become a little selfish and say, well, poor little, little me. So, this is when it's really important to have good people around you. And I'm specifically looking at my wife right now to talk you off the cliff or strong men that are around you and, and, and they help you out and, send, and, and then they confirm that you're doing the right thing. I really believe that we have to be surrounded by more than one person or persons and we have to have that light mindedness of following Jesus because you know, sometimes you just are tired and you don't want to go on anymore and then other people help you get back. So I, I think that you have to have some really good people around you that are like-minded, that you know that when things are settled down and you talk about the basics and the priorities of life, you have the same list of priorities. And so they help you get back on track. That's what I, that would be my answer. And as men, and I guess most everybody who's in here is, is a man, we sometimes we just want to go the solo route and i'm telling you you can do that but you're going to find yourself being very lonely and you're going to find yourself talking yourself into things that aren't real smart you better have some good people around you. that's awesome i'm gonna ask you one more question and then we'll finish up i think this is a good way to uh to finish it out obviously um i think probably most of the dads on here know you know being a college football coach uh, requires a significant amount of time and, and commitment. Um, and of course you did that during your children's formative years. And uh, somebody asked the question, how did you balance those job responsibilities with raising your children? And then is there any advice that you would give of things that you might do differently now that you have that 2020 hindsight to look back on that time. 
Another really good question. Uh, what we did while, when we were going through it, we, we had a schedule and um, we, we stuck with that schedule. So when I was in coaching, Thursday nights was kind of the night where I could come home after practice. And so we, it was always a night we, we could be there together. Uh, I was very fortunate because most of the, you know, 12, 12 seasons that I was in coaching in my 22, I was the head coach. So I set the schedule. So I made sure I was home in, in time to put everybody to bed. And then we invested in the equipment that I could bring the videos home and, and still do my work after they went to bed. So we made that. But there's also some other things that I decided not to do. And that was, um, I'm not a very good golfer, but I decided you, you can't, you can't play golf um, and, and raising your kids with the job that you have, okay? Because you can't take five hours when you do have the time to be at home. You can't take that five hours and, and go off, okay? You, you're, you're with your buddies enough at work. So there's some things that you have to sacrifice. And then I, I want to talk to you guys. Uh, man, this is great. You all let me talk. You have to make a commitment to be with other believers. You have to go to church. And I know right now, this is a tough time to be going to church. But I want to tell you, your kids have to be in that environment. But more importantly, they have to see that it's important to you. And even today at our church, if we told all of our kids, okay, and we don't go to church with them now, and, and two of our three kids live out of state, but if we were all going to meet on the Sunday and say, we'll meet you at church and worship time is at 11, okay, they would all end up at 11 o'clock in the same spot waiting on us to come and sit with them as they know where we sit. They knew that we were going to be there. They have to know that it means something to you too. It can't just be lip service. That's great, Coach. Well, thanks again for uh, sharing your time with us today, sharing your wisdom. Um, we, we really uh, appreciate that um and uh we want to wish you the the best and know that uh your friends over at metro are here to uh to support you um as you move forward uh with your career and everything like that so i'm going to close us in a word of prayer and then uh we'll get out of here so uh before i do that i want to thank all the uh individuals that joined us um i know this is not the way that we would prefer to do uh, our foundational fathers. We prefer to do it the old way where we get to get together and we get to fellowship and we get to eat donuts together and we get to see our kids' classrooms and do that fun stuff. And hopefully that day's coming uh, again soon, but thank you guys for taking the time to join us virtually. So I'm gonna close this in prayer and then we'll get out of here. Dear God, thank you so much again for uh, Coach Raider. Thank you for the wisdom that uh, you shared uh, through his uh, speech today, Lord. We just pray that you continue to uh, bless him as he uh, represents us in the state Senate, but more importantly, as he uh, represents you as a light in the community and, and a light in the world, Lord. We just ask that you uh, bless our school. We ask that you uh, bless our fathers, both those who were on the virtual Zoom with us today and those who were not. Lord, I pray a special blessing on our uh, football coaches and our uh, football team as they uh, prepare to start the playoffs tonight, Lord, that you continue to watch over them, that you keep them safe, that you keep them healthy, Lord, and you continue to provide success for them throughout this, Lord, because, again, uh, I know the heart of the school, I know the heart of our coaches, and I know the platform that football serves to them, which is to bring glory and honor to your name and be a witness uh, throughout the state. So I just pray for that blessing upon them. And uh, thank you for all that you do for us. Help us to have a great weekend. Help everybody to be safe. Help everybody to have a great Thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Everybody have a great day. Hope to see you at the football game tonight.